Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar hosted by Esteco. It is meant to be a very general getting started with parametric design optimization. My name is Alexander Dugan. I'm a senior application engineer at our Esteco North America office uh, out of uh, Metro Detroit, Michigan, USA. The agenda for this one hour webinar will start with a very brief overview of uh, the products uh, that Esteco offers, and we'll get into some real general examples of parametric optimization and how that's accomplished through process automation, design of experiments, post-processing. Uh, then we'll add some intelligence using optimization strategies, and uh, we'll conclude with a few uh, powerful industrial success stories. So Esteco as a company uh, sells two products, um, our desktop platform called Mode Frontier uh, and our web platform called Volta. So getting into parametric design optimization, we'll start with a very brief introduction. So what is it? Uh, so parametric optimization actually is a uh, changing value somewhere in a solver. Uh, here are some very nice visual examples, like the number of uh, fins uh, on a propeller, for example. It can be discrete like that, or uh, continuous, let's say the, the height of a vehicle, or the angle of the windshield in the example on, on the right-hand side. Uh, so it can accomplish many different uh, applications, very general, as you'll see as we go through this webinar. Uh, just as a, as a note, it's not topology optimization, that is a completely separate discipline compared to parametric optimization. So we'll start with some real uh, world examples. Uh, this first one is courtesy of Bombardier Trains. They uh, used Mode Frontier to optimize the, the shape of their trains to minimize drag, which of course minimize cost of operation, which does give them a competitive edge. Uh, so the solver in this case was a CFD, the mode frontier was used to drive the, the CFD simulation optimizing drag. So here it is, um, you can see the, the shape of the train, uh, parameterized of course in uh, a CAD, in this case CATIA. Uh, so the, the main idea here is to change the shape of the, the front end and the rear end of the train. So this, this shape is also reflected uh, to be in the tail end of the train as well. And because of that, there was a lot of freedom given to the, the shape change. And the initial point you see at the bottom, that is the, the best they could do in a wind tunnel with their aerodynamicists. Uh, so they gave us their baseline design and they said, okay, if you can improve this, um, then that'll be a very strong selling point for optimization. And this was back over 10 years ago. Um, so we parameterized the CAD part and what you're going to see as I advance these slides is you'll see the shape change and the associated uh, drag force coming out of, uh, of the CFD solver. So quite a bit of design freedom as you see this first point as uh, very little intelligence. This was just to explore the design space. Uh, we gave it enough freedom to play with, let's say, uh, having a spoiler, so which may help with separation in the rear, of course, we let it go. The optimization will learn from this as uh, you know being a poorly performing design, and so as it learns, you'll see it explores the space fairly well. And this step is where the optimizer kicks in, so the intelligence has started, and you can see already we've improved over what they could do in the wind tunnel. And we kept it running, as you can see, it's still trying to do minor shape changes, and we get slight improvements in drag. But eventually, we converge into an optimal. Um, shape. And uh, this, of course, was done using uh, CFD. And they actually built this in the wind tunnel, the shape that we provided, the optimized uh, train shape. And they did get a huge benefit um, in, in drag for this train, which led to real world results. So the uh, drag on this was reduced by 20%, which, of course, led them to win you know, future contracts uh, over their competition. Another example, uh, this one automotive, um, uh, optimization of a, a muffler. So here they wanted to make sure at different um, frequencies that they, they got the right tone, they're not going too loud. And uh, they're doing that by changing the perforations and of course the, the baffles, the angle of the baffle and the position of it. 
So here they're showing you the um, problem statement. Again, the uh, objective here was to minimize the, the back pressure at a specific RPM, subject to uh, making sure that these harmonics do not exceed some decibel level. So here I'll just play a video of the ongoing optimization that was done in Mode Frontier. So on the top, you're seeing the back pressure performance. And on the right, you're seeing the associated geometry that came out of this um, uh, solver. Uh, so you can see as it's going, it's steadily decreasing the back pressure and we're making sure that the uh, decibel level is not exceeding our constraint limit. So on the, on the left, you'll notice the boxes of green. Green means all the constraints were met, so valid design, anything in uh, yellow or orange, that would be a violation. So you can see it starts off with many unfeasibles, but as again that intelligence is brought into the optimization loop, we can see that now we're getting mainly valid designs and uh, again converging to an optimal muffler design. Another example, this was uh, again uh, marine and offshore. Um, this was to optimize the, the riser geometry. So these ships need to be tethered via an umbilical to the seafloor. And so they need to be uh, kind of immune to uh, elevation changes, let's say the, the tides, uh, the waves. We don't want this riser to break. Uh, so they have a number of constraints here. They want to limit the curvature, limit tension, uh, make sure there's enough clearance on uh, the ocean floor. But uh, the objectives were to minimize the cost of this riser, which is just this, uh, this pipe you're seeing here, and uh, minimize the buoyancy of it as well. So this was uh, one of the earlier design configurations. Uh, this is a later design, and finally you see the optimal configuration. So again, slight mod of my, uh, minor changes, but they did save quite a bit in cost um, and get the same performance here out of this riser. Uh, yeah, so here's just a, a use case in the marine and offshore uh, sector, uh, how Mode Frontier and parametric optimization was used uh, to design this riser and make sure that it uh, you know, met all of their requirements. Uh, here they were using uh, multiple solvers, so it doesn't have to be just one solver that you're using like in the previous examples. Here they used a finite element analysis to ensure the stresses were okay. They used the riser design codes, maybe custom codes that they had to make sure clearances were met, that the curvature was okay. Also they used fatigue codes uh, to make sure that this thing would, wouldn't fail after many cycles of loading. Going into the aerospace domain, uh, this was a very recent project uh, out of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. It was uh, called Expedite, and it was a program sponsored by the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, they wanted uh, to apply optimization, specifically the multidisciplinary optimization techniques to design a, f uh, a fighter aircraft. So they had uh, just two objectives plotted here. You're seeing on the, on the plot on the left, so ferry range, which they wanted to maximize, and then cost on the vertical axes, which of course they wanted to minimize. And uh, here they've converged uh, to a, what we call a Pareto front, which we'll cover a little bit later. Uh, but basically they end up with a number of trade-off solutions. So they can do, have a, a shape that's very good in ferry range, uh, not so great on cost. And then they could have a, a design that's very good on cost, but they sacrifice on their ferry range. So why optimize? Uh, Oftentimes, it's to meet very stringent uh, requirements. So this could be imposed as regulations from the government or just internal requirements that you, you need to meet. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to manually optimize to meet these requirements. Uh, it's time consuming as you go to iteration after iteration manually. It's better to use uh, like a robot, like it's done in uh, mass production, right? Um, the same idea applies in software. So we want to hook up a software robot that can go through many, many design iterations for us so we don't have to be there and it can run 24-7. Uh, of course, optimized design also gives you an edge over the competition 
if your competition isn't doesn't have the same performance as you, uh, then that gives you an edge, right? Uh, we'll have examples, uh, real world examples, uh, to show you that in a second. Uh, also, it just avoids the the tedious nature of of manually doing many many iterations uh, to meet these requirements. There's also many more reasons, which we'll get into later. So does optimization have real benefits? Uh, so this was out of Embraer, uh, aircraft manufacturer. Uh, they were tasked with improving the fuel burn of their aircraft, uh, the E-175, uh, so that they could be more competitive in the market. And they applied uh, parametric optimization to the, the winglets. So they're the, the tips of the wing. They applied some shape optimization to reduce the, the drag uh, of, their, of that aircraft. And they used uh, Mode Frontier to do that. Here's the optimization results. They selected a, a wingtip that gave uh, improved uh, fuel burn reduction. So after rolling out this optimized design, which gave 6.4% fuel burn reduction, uh, you can see how their market share uh, went from pre-optimized, less than 50%, to currently, uh, 2013 through 2017, uh, the pie chart on the right side. You can see the predominantly now this uh, E175 plus, meaning the optimized design as control over the market. So how do we perform optimization specifically? How does uh, this robot, the software robot, take over and automate our, our processes? Uh, the concept is uh, workflow-based, uh, in Mode Frontier at least. Uh, so we start with uh, defining your input variables. Uh, so these are the parameters uh, in your system that you want the optimization to tune or to change to get an improved design on the back end. So that would be your output variables. These are the responses of your system. Just a way to measure how you're performing if you're meeting all the requirements. Uh, so these inputs are fed into what we call or term a black box. Uh, this can be any number of different types of solvers. So it can range from here, CAD, CAE, uh, find an element. Uh, they can also be hooked up to a test cell or a test bench. We have uh, many examples of, of that being done. So it doesn't always have to be software. The black box could be hardware as well. And then if you do optimization, there's the optimization loop that goes around this. Uh, so that's what you're seeing, that feedback loop at the dotted line at the top. Uh, so inputs are fed into the black box. They make their changes. We measure the, the responses of the system, store them in outputs. We apply our objectives and constraints. So it could be any number of objectives, any number of constraints, any number of analyses within the black box. And we, we ask ourselves, are we satisfied with that design? If yes, we're done. The design is, is finished, it's optimized. If not, uh, we want to intelligently change the inputs again and try over, see if we can match and meet our uh, desired requirements and performance. Uh, so this feedback loop, this optimization feedback loop, can be done um, just with a DOE, so no intelligence. So just running through different iterations automatically. Uh, or we can apply a, an intelligent algorithm to that uh, to intelligently go back and change our inputs based off of what it's learned from previous designs and previous iterations. So the influence of the algorithm choice is, is very important here, and we'll, we'll see that later. So as we alluded to earlier, many different types of parametric uh, input variables. Uh, here are very visual ones, as you can see. Uh, at the top, it makes a lot of sense. Continuous variables, these can be dimensions of a part, for example. Uh, and it could be discrete. So you saw the number of blades on a propeller. Um, also could be from a catalog, let's say. So if you had to pick from gauges of thicknesses of materials, you can do that. Or if you're picking here tires uh, or wheel sizes, um, those would be picking from a catalog. So you can imagine uh, the first tire would be, uh, value would be one, the next tire would be two, three, and so on. 
So what can the black box be? Uh, most often they are some type of a CAE tool, so some type of software. Uh, a lot of times it's in-house codes, uh, scripting languages that, that uh, you use uh, in your company. We can integrate those as part of this black box. Uh, or they could be standard uh, computer-aided engineering codes, uh, CAD, for example, FEA, CFD, you've seen so far. And even, as I mentioned, could come from a, a test cell. Here are just some examples. These are the ones that we have direct integrations to, so they're built in to Mode Frontier. It just makes the integrations uh, much simpler. Um, but like I mentioned, if you do have in-house codes or you use codes that aren't listed here, there are ways for us to uh, hook on to those and drive those codes via either command line or some type of API. Here is an example of a simple workflow already built. The green icons you're seeing at the top, those are the free input variables, the parameters that we are changing. In this case, you can see they're fed into a geometric package and that's driving the, uh, some type of shape change. Um, so top to bottom is data flow. You see the inputs go in and then out on the, out, on the bottom, you're seeing outputs come out of the system. Mass is being calculated uh, directly from the CAD package. The geometry is then fed to uh, an FEA solver, in this case, Abacus, and that's calculating stresses. So you're seeing stress come out uh, as a response. And then at the very bottom of the screen, you see our objectives and constraints. So this workflow is tasked with minimizing the mass, minimizing the stress of the whatever part that's being optimized or assembly that's being optimized. And then we have a constraint on the stress. So some limit on stress that needs to be met. And then left to right is the, the process chain. So you start with some type of symbolic start, let's say, of some type of optimization strategy, which you're seeing here as NSGA is the algorithm. And then we're running through, we're running the CAD, then the FEA, and then in the feedback loop is implied. So it's going to run through this left to right many, many times as it's learning and optimizing the, the system. As I mentioned, direct integration, these are already built in to Mode Frontier. It makes coupling with the third-party uh, software very easy, uh, very automatic in nature as well. But if you have other in-house codes or codes that uh, do not have a direct integration provided for you, uh, we have other methods to uh, hook in and link to these uh, other codes as well. Switching over to design of experiments. So I will refer to that from now on as a DOE. Uh, so the main idea behind DOE is to explore your input space. So all of the inputs have a set lower bound and a set upper bound, which we need to abide to. Uh, but within that lower bound, upper bound range, we're free to choose any, any design that we like. Unless we have, of course, some constraints applied on our inputs. But normally, we have full freedom uh, within the input space. So we want to search this space as best we can. We want to make sure that we don't put points too close together, for example, because we're not maximizing our information out of the system. Uh, most likely, if points are very close, right, designs that are very, very similar to each other should give similar response. So we want to get more toward what's on the left we have a nice spread of the points rather than cluster our points somewhere uh, and kind of miss out on information that we could be getting from other parts of the, of the space. Of course, how you sample is up to you. There's a number of methods built in to Mode Frontier to help you sample the space uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, and it really depends on what you're trying to get out of the study. So if you're just doing statistical analysis, we have a number of uh, DOE methods available to you to get the best statistical analysis uh, for you. Uh, if your goal is to train some type of meta model, surrogate model, or RSM, uh, we have uh, other techniques for that, even automated and adaptive techniques to help you improve the RSM uh, sort of automatically. And then if you're doing optimization uh, as your end goal, you want to use a DOE 
to give a starting point for the algorithm to learn from. Um, uh, now, with the more advanced optimization algorithms, this is kind of an optional step uh, because the optimization algorithm itself can automatically do the, the DOE sampling for you. This is a full list of all of the DOE algorithms uh, built into Mode Frontier. Uh, they range from the space fillers, which are somewhat pseudo-random techniques, or two full random techniques. Um, and then we have more of the statistical design, so these are deterministic, grid-based uh, sampling methods. Then we have our robust system reliability-based designs. So if, if you want to measure, for example, how well your design does to um, different conditions, so off nominal conditions, for example, is, is uh, one good case for this. Then we have our optimal designs. So these are meant to uh, improve an existing data set. So we have our reducers, which if you had a lot of data, it can reduce the data while still maintaining its uniformity. Same with this data set reducer. And uh, the optimal similar uh, idea and concept is to optimize this set um, Usually the optimal is applied if you're going to train RSMs or some type of meta model on that data. So going into the details of just one of these ex of uh, algorithms, so uniform Latin hypercube. So it's just a shortcut to a uniformly distributed Latin hypercube. Uh, so the internally the way it works, as you're kind of seeing here on the left, is pure random uh, Monte Carlo type of uh, distribution. And then on the right is we have the, the Latin hypercube with the uniform distribution put on top of it. Uh, so as you can see, it kind of splits the space. If you had two input variables, it splits the space into these uh, grids. And then it puts a point in every row and every column, and only one point in that row and only one point in that column. And in the back end, there is also optimization going on. Uh, to make sure that we minimize any type of correlation uh, among the free input variables. So they, of course, those should not never be correlated. And also it's going to try to maximize the distance between uh, the points. So getting good coverage uh, with these type of optimization routines going on in the background. So after you run all of these de design points, you're going to end up with a lot of data. So this is a run within Mode Frontier. We've gone through that optimization or DOE loop, and we've collected all the measurements from the system. Uh, in, in Mode Frontier, they're stored in tables like this. So every design iterations, every one of these rows corresponds to a design, a unique design. Uh, and as you go down, uh, you collect more and more data right? as it's going through this loop. So here we're plotting the, the history. This is one chart available to you. Uh, so if, if F2 was to be minimized, you can see how it drove it down to a minimum. Uh, and we can plot one response like this or many responses. At, or, so we're kind of seeing the history over time of this optimization loop that's going on. It's a good indicator if, if the system is converging to some type of optimum. Or, or not, let's say we're diverging, going in the wrong direction, I may want to stop it, fix something, and restart again. We have higher dimensional charts as well available to you uh, to post-process and make sense out of the data. Uh, so scatter gives you 2D, we have a 3D and a 4D scatter, so the other dimensions could be represented as color and diameter of the, the bubbles here. Just a way for you to visualize as well how the system is performing especially in multi-objective scenarios, um, you're operating not only, uh, you're not looking only at one single response, but you have to look at many responses simultaneously to see how the, the optimization or DOE is performing. And that leads into n-dimensional charts. These can be up to as many as you can visualize on the screen. One of the more commonly used ones is the parallel coordinates chart. Uh, which is shown, an example is shown here at the bottom. It looked kind of messy at first, but it's uh, incredibly powerful uh, because, again, n-dimensional, I can plot as many uh, inputs and outputs as, uh, as I choose. And every line, if you see left to right, 
is one design configuration. And I can drag down these filters, for example, and I can remove designs that have too high stress. I can drive down the weight and see what's left over. And even if you have hundreds to thousands of different designs, like you're seeing here, just by dragging and filtering out some of the poor performing designs, um, you can quickly narrow down into a region of interest. Uh, so it's a good way of doing live uh, trade-off analyses, live design selection. And a lot of times this is done with uh, in collaboration with others. So someone may have a requirement on stress, someone may have a requirement on weight, and they need to come to some type of agreement uh, or middle ground, and that can be done using this chart. Statistical analysis is also uh, available in Mode Frontier. If you were to do uh, one of those statistical DOE studies and run that, uh, you can do correlation uh, plots like this. So I can make sure you know my inputs are not correlated. And then I could also see uh, which inputs are causing the most effect on my outputs. Uh, so the one on the right here, you're clearly seeing there's some big correlation between some input A and the, the weight. It clearly shown here as a dark red, meaning highly correlated, highly positively correlated. The blue ones are a negative correlation. Uh, so in that case, you would see opposite effect. So for example, on this deformation, C is inversely correlated. So if I wanted to decrease deformation, I may want to increase my value for parameter C. We can represent that same chart, but add more information using um, the scatter matrix. So the bottom left triangle is the same as you saw before, correlations. And then the upper right triangle is the 2D projections of this uh, n-dimensional space. Uh, so it's kind of giving you idea of how well we're searching around in, this, uh, in the high dimensional space, uh, in this case, three dimensions. So onto optimization, how it's applied. So there's two main types of optimization. Uh, it can be single objective, like you saw with that train example earlier on, where it was just trying to minimize drag. Or it can be multi-objective, like you saw with the uh, Lockheed Martin aircraft. Uh, it had two objectives, right? The ferry time and the cost. So more often than not, in real-world uh, engineering, we end up in this multi-objective domain. And so there's no one answer in that case. You end up with many, many different common, uh, many, many different optimal designs that uh, you must choose from. And I kind of alluded to that in the parallel coordinate chart when I was saying we need to come up to some agreement or some trade-off uh, among our objectives. A very, very simple example of a multi-objective optimization problem. Let's say I'm trying to uh, minimize the weight and deflection simultaneously of this beam with an applied force. So this is naturally going to be competing objectives. So if I remove weight from this beam, I remove material, I'm going to increase my deflection caused by this force and vice versa. So when you have any objectives that are conflicting, you're going to end up with this uh, trade-off space we call the Pareto frontier. Here is an example of, uh, of a Pareto frontier uh, from this beam. Uh, so weight on the horizontal axis, deformation on the vertical axis. Our uh, utopia point, so the ideal design would be somewhere in the bottom left corner. But of course, the physics don't allow that. So we end up hitting up on this boundary of the system as the optimizer is pushing and pushing as best it can to meet our objectives, it eventually hits this, hits this limit. And you're seeing that as the dotted line. This dotted line is the Pareto frontier. It basically means you cannot improve in all objectives simultaneously anymore. To gain in one objective, you must sacrifice in at least one other objective. So you can clearly see that. If I want to get better deformation, I must increase my weight. And if I want to get better weight, I must increase my deformation. So let's compare the two. We'll compare a single objective optimization 
uh, versus multi-objective optimization. So a lot of times we're asked, um, why can't I just create a merit function or a, a combined uh, objective function and just put it into, into one? So in this example, we applied both approaches, single and multi-objective. Uh, the first approach, single objective, is here you're trying to maximize the absolute value lift over drag. Uh, this is a shape change again and CFD problem of a Formula 3 wing. So we varied the, the shape of this wing using 10 different uh, parameters and we are recording lift and drag. The bottom you're seeing the, the history of the single objective optimization. So here you can see as it's maximizing, we are eventually converging to a optimal solution. And the, how that looks in the multi-objective space is like this. So it converged directly to uh, a point that had really good lift, but was quite poor in, in drag. So this is kind of the downside of doing single objective optimization is you, you may inadvertently converge to an extreme of this trade-off space. And you're missing out on a, on a lot of different solutions that uh, could even perform better for you. So now we're going to apply the multi-objective approach. So lift and drag treated as separate objectives and we're applying a multi-objective optimization algorithm. Uh, in this case, fast NSGA was the optimization algorithm that was used to generate this. As you can see, we have a much richer set of designs now. We're not quickly converging to a particular design, uh, particular point on the, on the front, right? So we have many, many optimal solutions. Some are good in lift, some are good in drag, but you more often than not will end up somewhere in the middle. You can make this uh, trade-off study and converge somewhere maybe in the middle so you get the kind of the best of both. If you were to do the single objective, you end up with a single design that's best and you go on with that. You never see these other trade-off solutions that may be better for you. Of course, usually multi-objective comes with uh, an expense. Uh, you can see here more points needed to be run uh, to, to populate this uh, Pareto front uh, compared to the single objective, which only gave you one point on the Pareto front. Here are the two strategies uh, overlaid on each other. So the, the blue points were multi-objective and the uh, square red points were the single objective. As you can see, you get a, a many more uh, options when you do multi-objective. So I can now pick a design that's uh, good in drag and I can sacrifice and lift. So in optimization, uh, there's also this robustness versus accuracy um, trade-off usually occurring when we run optimization. Uh, some algorithms are very robust, meaning that they, if you run them for long enough, they can always converge to the global optimum. Um, usually they're slow. Uh, they take a lot of iterations to do that. Uh, other algorithms are very accurate. These are uh, usually the derivative-based strategies, meaning they can quickly converge and very accurately converge to a local optimum. The problem is they're not robust, so they usually cannot escape the local optimum. So you can see the chart on the top. This was a, a global optimization where it escaped all these local peaks, if you're trying to maximize, it escaped all these local peaks and converged to the global peak, global optimum peak here. Whereas the derivative based or the accurate method may converge to a local optimum and get stuck there. So it could converge to one of these suboptimal peaks and get stuck. So the way we classify the different types of optimization algorithms are shown here. So there's this uh, global search versus local refinement, and then you have the accuracy versus robustness. So Usually those go somewhat hand in hand. Uh, a global search method is going to usually be more robust, whereas a local convergent algorithm is usually gonna be more accurate. Now we do have some in the middle ground that are proprietary to a Stecco. These are the multi-strategy algorithms you see here. These are trying to bridge that gap 
uh, basically giving you very, very accurate, quick converging um, results, but also trying to escape any local optimums that it, it may get stuck in. So there's a number of ways we do that, um, which we'll get into in a minute. As I mentioned, the derivative algorithms, those are built into Mode Frontier. Um, these start off by uh, a random point, for example, or if you have a known good baseline, you can start from there. It basically needs to calculate the partial derivatives to get a gradient. A gradient. From that gradient, it has a direction of improvement. Uh, so it will go in that direction, evaluate the partial derivatives again, re-go re in that direction of improvement, and it'll keep going like that until it reaches uh, an area where it cannot improve any further, so basically where the gradient is zero. This is very, very good at quick convergence and accurate convergence, uh, but you do sacrifice on the, the global search, so it will get stuck in any uh, local optimums that it encounters. So there is the global search algorithms to get around that problem. Um, these are usually some type of uh, genetic algorithm. Uh, these are very, very good at exploring the space. Uh, it doesn't get stuck. And the, the reason why it doesn't get stuck is there's some type of or a degree of randomness built into the search. Uh, so basically, it, it can always search. It, it never stops until you stop it or it hits the maximum that you've defined. The, the trade-off with these, though, is that they can be very, very slow. Uh, meaning it requires a lot of iterations through the optimization loop to converge to an optimal solution. So with all these different algorithms, how do you choose which is best for for your application? Uh, three main points to keep in mind. Uh, how much time do you have, of course? That's a critical one. Uh, if your deadline is in a couple days, and each simulation takes some the magnitude of hours, you're probably not going to be able to run a multi-objective genetic algorithm, uh, one of the global search methods, because it requires more time to converge to an optimum. Uh, also keep in mind the number of variables and objectives. Uh, if you have many, many variables, let's say tens to hundreds of input variables, uh, the dimension dimensionality of the search space is vast. So it's going to require more iterations for you to search that huge multidimensional space. Same with the objectives. The more objectives you have, the larger that Pareto front becomes. Uh, so we try to keep those down below five objectives, preferably. And then, of course, initial study versus solution refinement. So if you already have a very good baseline solution and you just want to make small improvements from there, uh, that's pretty quick. But if you're starting from uh, a poor starting point or a, not even a, a baseline, you have you have no idea. You're just doing a, a, a global search. That's going to require more time because the optimizer has to search around the entire space to find that optimal solution. So basically, there's no best op, uh, algorithm for all. That's why we give you kind of a toolbox of algorithms uh, so you can pick the best tool for your problem. Here are a few, uh, I guess, um, rules to follow uh, or guidelines, uh, very rough guidelines. Uh, so if you have lots of computations allowed, you can run these genetic algorithms. Uh, so these are the MOGA, multi-objective gen genetic algorithm, NSGA, non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm. Uh, but if you are allowed only a few computations in your allotted time and you have lots of variables, uh, we take a different strategy. If in case you had few variables, uh, we can apply a different strategy and so on. Going into detail of just one of these strategies, uh, it's a visual example so you can get an idea of how it works. This uh, algorithm is called simplex. It's a heuristic algorithm, basically meaning it doesn't rely on any type of derivative or gradient. It has four main operations. Uh, you can they're listed there, and you can see what each one does at the bottom. 
Uh, so the idea here is to start with um, a number of starting points where it can create this shape. And then based on the shape, it's going to undergo operations, so reflection, contraction, expansion, or I can even do a, a multiple contraction as required. So depending on what each one does, so if it reflects and that point is good, it keeps it. If that point is worse, it can contract. So basically each one of these movements is trying to find a direction of improvement. So what does that look like? We have a video here. So here's the three points it starts with. The worst point gets reflected. If it's better, it's kept. If not, it's contracted. And then in this case, it's kept. And it keeps going through these operations, reflection, contraction, until it can no longer uh, improve. So here we're trying to maximize. We're going into that red region. And eventually, again, each worst point is reflected and contracted until it can no longer uh, make any further movement. So we've reached the optimum. So a visual example of just one of these algorithms uh, and how they work. We'll go into a little detail of the genetic algorithm since they're so uh, commonly used. Uh, the main benefit of a genetic algorithm is it can work for all types of problems. So it can work with continuous variables, discrete variables, uh, catalog variables, and any combination of those. It can also work with single objective or multi-objective. It can work with highly constrained or not constrained problems. So it's kind of the last resort. If you have a really, really difficult um, optimization problem and uh, you, you need a solution, genetic algorithms will always get you there. The problem is they will be usually very slow, requiring a lot of iterations. So the way genetic algorithms work is based off of nature and the survival of the fittest. So we start off with an initial population. Uh, the best performing designs out of the population are most likely to be kept and kind of their traits get carried on into the, the future generations as the design is um, undergoing um, changes. So an example of this, uh, this is one from the EPA. Uh, it was publicly available optimization problem of, uh, of a pipe network. Uh, this is trying to deliver water to homes, for example, and they want to lay out uh, the pipes in a way that we get const uh, we get we meet pressure at each one of the nodes. So each house in the node network here gets the proper amount of water pressure. Uh, you can see the flow rates that they've targeted there with the arrows. And the objective here is to, to minimize the cost by uh, using cheaper pipes. So pipes that have smaller diameter uh, will save in cost. So the idea is we want to pick pipes from a catalog uh, to try to minimize the total cost. So we can't do gradients because we're picking from a known list of pipes. And it's a combinatorial problem uh, so simplex wouldn't work either. It can't get, really get a direction uh, when it does those moves. So this is a case where we actually have to apply a genetic algorithm. Each one of the, the houses are different elevations, so different heights. Each one has a different demand. And you can see the, the list here. And this is the catalog I was mentioning earlier. So each um, pipe diameter has an associated cost. We parameterize this by applying an index. So this third column here is actually the parameter that the optimizer is changing. So if the optimizer demands um, uh, pipe number six, it would be this one here, diameter 10 inches and cost $32 per meter. So this is the actual value that you see, but the optimizer internally is going to convert that into binary. And the, the binary representation of each one of these values is shown here in this last column. In this case, we can get away with just four bit binaries since our numbers only go from zero to 13. 
So if we come up with a, a design of this pipe network, each one of the pipes has picked, uh, has an associated diameter that the optimizer has picked. So for example, pipe one in that network, we are using a, a pipe with 18 uh, as the diameter and so on. So if we carry that down, we convert it to our human readable index that you see. And then what the optimizer is seeing, which is the binary, converted the 10 to binary, converted eight to binary and so on. We can combine this into a long list of zeros and ones. So binary representation of the system. And in genetic terminology, this is kind of the DNA of this design, the binary DNA of this particular design. So once we have this binary DNA, you can undergo operations. Uh, the first operation we'll undergo is this um, crossover. So it requires uh, two parents, so two designs, and their DNA uh, will get spliced at a particular point. So here we could randomly pick a uh, point in the DNA where we want to cut it. Uh, at that point, we swap the DNA. So one piece of one parent and another piece of another parent is used to create one child, and the other pieces are used to create the, the next child in the population. So as you can see, the characteristics of the parents get carried on to the next generation and into the, the children designs uh, carried forward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, randomness is built into all of these. So there's some type of random mutation that occurs. Uh, usually this is just a switch of a bit. So changing a zero to a one or a one to a zero somewhere randomly in, in, within this binary DNA. And then we want to make sure that the best designs carry forward. So they're allowed to um, share their characteristics with the future generations. So the way this works is each design is given a fitness uh, percentage. So let's say your population, in this case, you have five uh, people in, in, the, uh, in the population, or five designs in the population. And Design ID 1 and 3 are the best, so they're assigned the highest fittest rate, uh, fitness ratings. Uh, their numbers are, are shown there, their percentages are shown there. So this roulette wheel, if you imagine it that way, if I were to spin this uh, roulette wheel, uh, I would have the most chance to land on uh, 3 or 1. So those are the ones that most likely will carry their characteristics to the next generation. But of course, to preserve the entire population, every design has a chance to be selected. So we don't want to accidentally throw away uh, a poor performing design because maybe that design is really good in one part, one minor aspect of the design. So maybe just a piece of it uh, can be combined with a stronger point, a design and create an even better one. So here's an example of a genetic algorithm, uh, the history of it. So you're seeing thousands and thousands of runs. Uh, this is very characteristic of a genetic algorithm. Uh, and it takes a very, very long time to converge, especially in a combinatorial problem like this, which has billions and billions of possibilities. Uh, so this was a run using MOGA, so multi-objective genetic algorithm. And it came up with a, a minimum cost of this pipe network at uh, $419,000. And uh, back when the EPA published this problem statement, I think that was the one of the best designs that had been found. Uh, that was many, many years ago, actually back in 2004. So maybe it's been in, improved since then. So there's also another category of algorithms, which are the multi-strategy algorithms. They try to combine uh, this global search and accuracy to try to get a middle ground or kind of get the best of both. Uh, these are proprietary to Esteco. The ones I'll go into a little bit of detail are the FAST algorithms, uh, Pylopt, and uh, Migo. These are the names of the algorithms. Uh, as I mentioned, the multi-strategy is trying to combine uh, a few different strategies into one. A lot of times they rely on some type, type of response surface to kind of quickly capture a trend. Uh, that's kind of what you're seeing here with this plot. And basically it's interpolating with the points uh, that you have, fitting a, a curve to those points. And based off of that rough estimate, 
it can quickly find a direction of improvement, a uh, mathematically predicted pr uh, direction of improvement. They can combine that with a genetic algorithm so that the genetic algorithm can operate and run off of this mathematical representation rather than actually running the solver itself. So of course this saves a lot of time because the mathematical representation runs very, very fast. And that's kind of where FAST gets its name. That's the, the name of the, the algorithm. Uh, the way it works is just like that. So it runs a DOE, it trains some type of mathematical representation. Uh, it does the optimization using that mathematical representation. So it's very, very quick to do the optimization. Uh, and it picks a few candidate points that it thinks. Again, it's a prediction based off of this mathematical model. It picks the points that it thinks will give it the best improvement, and then it actually runs those through a validation. So it actually will take those points that it thinks are the best, or those designs that it thinks will do the best. It runs them actually through the solver, and then if it's not good, at least it learns something. That'll get fed back into the population, and again, we repeat. So now, this time through, the second time through the loop, it has more points to train this mathematical model, it does the optimization all over again, picks what it thinks is the best, and it repeats. So the idea here is we want to leverage this mathematical model to grab a, a trend earlier on in the optimization loop uh, to cut down on the number of runs. So this is a common algorithm for very expensive simulations. Let's say FEA or CFD that take um, you know hours to days to run, we would uh, likely recommend some type of surrogate-assisted or RSM-assisted optimization algorithm. PyLopt is that as well, uh, but it can automatically self-adapt as it's going. So this is one of our most advanced optimizers. Um, so that it also uses a response surface in the background, uh, so you don't actually see it going on. And it adapts. So if it knows that the, the mathematical representation isn't giving accurate solutions, it's going to learn and not use that as much. It may put more runs toward a GA, for example, a genetic algorithm. But if the meta model is, is performing really well, it's going to prioritize that and adapt to that and add more runs using RSMs or this mathematical representation. It can be used for almost all scenarios. It's kind of our one-click optimizer. Um, so from moderate to heavy simulations, it's a, it's a good choice, a good starting point for, uh, for uh, novice users all the way up to expert users uh, because, because of its self-adapting nature. Another strategy, a more recent one we've uh, added, is called MIGO. Uh, multi-objective efficient global optimization algorithm. It's a Bayesian style optimization algorithm. Uh, so basically it's trying to um, maximize the expected improvement. Uh, so if you were to give it three points, these are, if your three points are uh, actually known points, so that's actually run through the simulation, they're represented here in blue. It can fit a, a Gaussian process to that which is the, the red line. And when you do that, you actually get some type of uncertainty band. As you can see, uh, the uncertainty is zero near the known points. So converges to zero at the, each of the blue points. As you get further away, the information is more sparse and the uncertainty grows. Uh, so that's why you can see in between these blue points, you have the biggest uncertainty and the band is widest. And the inspected, expected improvement could be, if you're feeling lucky, uh, you would want to maybe pick around 0.7. And that's kind of what it's showing here. 0.7 could be bad, or it could be very, very good. Uh, so that's kind of what this uh, efficient global optimization algorithm is trying to do, is trying to get you to that global optimum in a very, very few number of actual simulations. And that's what it just did there. So now you can see it, it actually requested that 
point around point seven to be evaluated for real. So now it has a known data point, uh, and it will adjust this its expected improvement function again, trying to maximize it. So now it may evaluate around 0.6 because that has the highest expected improvement. So getting into some more industrial success stories um, and to show you kind of the broad uh, application of parametric optimization. So we'll start again, uh, start with a, an aerospace uh, an aerodynamics example. This one was from uh, uh, Leonardo aircraft, they were trying to design an environmentally friendly aircraft. Um, so they want to minimize the drag, weight, and environmental impact. And so they used parametric optimization to do that, to parameterize the shape of the aircraft. Um, and then they used a genetic algorithm uh, to optimize it. So here you can see the benefits at the bottom, 4% wing weight reduction and 2.5% uh, enhancement of the aerodynamic performance. In automotive, it's heavily used in the safety domain. Um, this is again because there's very stringent regulations uh, for crash analysis of, of cars that we drive. Um, so to meet that, a lot of times optimization is employed. Uh, so here they're trying to um, optimize the rear impact uh, crash scenario um, to make sure that the, they call it the HIC, the head injury criterion, is acceptable uh, or good. So they actually want to improve from acceptable to good. So they employed uh, multi-objective and they even added the robustness uh, to that as well to make sure that any uncertainties of, uh, of the individual's proportion, so everyone is a different height, a different weight, a different width, and so on. Uh, these are all uncertainties in the system, so they wanted to account for that. So they got that good impact, and uh, because they employed process automation and the intelligence with optimization, the turnaround time versus manual was reduced considerably. In civil engineering and even architecture, we see optimization and parametric optimization being heavily used to um, improve the energy ratings of buildings. So improving um, heat retention in the winter. So the, the windows should let light through in, in certain areas of the building in the winter. And then in the summertime, right, we want to reject that heat. Uh, so you may have some type of mirror system used to reflect the light or some adaptive system. Uh, to adapt to the changing weather. Uh, a lot of times they use optimization to, um, to improve that efficiency. Uh, so the benefits you can see here of, of that, uh, they improved the energy by 33% of a building uh, using optimization. Another use case in uh, electronics, uh, this was optimizing uh, an antenna, uh, so it had great reception, right, at uh, a certain frequency band, and while reducing loss of uh, signal power as well. Here they used a, a CAD package along with a solver for the electronic side, and they optimized that antenna. Uh, and again, clearly see the benefits here of, of applying optimization. And this was a more recent one since they used the PyLopt algorithm. And uh, here they made a comment. In just a few hours of simulation, they got a, a, an optimized antenna. Uh, another example of marine offshore. This is a European project called Gas Vessel. Um, the idea here is to optimize the uh, containment vessels to carry natural gas. Uh, on a ship or a cargo ship, for example. And uh, so there's a lot goes into that. They want to optimize these, these vessels, which are carbon fiber or some type of composite fiber. So there's a lot of variables in that type of material um, optimization. So the number of layers of the fiber, the orientation of the fiber, all of these are parameters that an optimization uh, routine uh, can use to improve the performance. So they wanted to uh, be able to minimize the cost 
basically of transportation of, uh, of natural gas from one point to another. Here's an example out of uh, biomedical, a uh, dental plant removal simulation. Uh, so they wanted to make sure when the dental implant is extracted, there's minimal necrosis of the surrounding area. Also, what's interesting of this one is they had some real world test data and they wanted to calibrate their model to meet that. So the optimization at that point becomes a model correlation or curve fit example. So the optimization is trying to minimize the difference between the real world test data and their uh, simulation model. And that's an optimization statement in and of itself. So hopefully you got a good idea of the power of parametric optimization and uh, how it could potentially be used in your organization to improve, uh, to improve your products. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. The emails are there listed.